Alrighty, well, thank you guys all for being here and all that are going to be joining us later here online. But uh, we're going to be doing a fun video about tying jigs for steelhead and kind of going through how to fish them, um, set up. I got a few things here that you guys can kind of put your hands on. But for me, a little bit of background. I mean, I've been in the fishing my whole life, 33 years old now. Um, looking back at this, steelhead was something that really sparked me. And I have a couple younger guys in the audience here, which is awesome to see you here. But truly, that's where it got started for me, your guys' age. So to be able to have you here is a real treat. Uh, thank you guys for, again, letting us do this. So we're gonna break down exactly how I go about it and the fun behind any type of fishing nowadays, but specifically with steelhead right now, you have the ability to really customize everything. You can tie your own jigs, you can make your own floats, your own rigs, everything is at your disposal to make how you want it. So I kind of wanted to bring that custom part to it for you guys to really see how I go about it on a daily basis, because a lot of this is done at home versus being something on the river. So we're gonna start with this here, and the first part we're gonna talk about there is gonna be regarding the jigs themselves, because tying a steelhead jig um, involves just a couple things at a basic level, right? A steelhead jig, as you can see on the picture up there, isn't very complicated. It's usually some kind of form of a lead head um, that you can either buy purchased, um, like, I have one, one that I really like to use is the Preport Maxi Jigs from Yakima Bay. They got really good hooks. You can find them literally at Walmart, wherever you want. Very easy to get. For those that don't have the custom lead pots and all that, this is a really great option to get started in it. And it's simple materials, it's a few basic steps, and allows you really to go into the whole realm of what you want to make it. And so there's a part here to talk about patterns themselves and why you make them, right? That's probably one of the most consistent patterns for steel is some form of pink. The pink and white makes a little contrast, but to go into a little bit more on why you make specific patterns, steelhead are very sight oriented. I mean, they grow up in the river, they're eating small bugs, they're picking up small things. As they get older, they're chasing after, um, you know, the spawning salmon eggs, they're really keyed into that component. So you can go from as much as a natural matching the hatch pattern to something that's gonna get their attention. That pink and white is definitely more of one to grab their attention, but there's days where they want something that's an olive, black woolly bugger style, and neutral mute, and that's the only thing they're gonna want to bite. So that's part of the fun. You can tie up a lot. Um, ultimately, you guys get a chance, you can come up here and take a look. I brought two of my full jig boxes that I put together, and you can see the range of patterns truly that are at your disposal. So that, that's part of the fun of really being able to, to hone it in. You can go as crazy wild as you want, you can stay as simple as you want. Um, and really, the second piece to that comes in when you start talking about conditions, because Matching the hatch is one thing, if truly they're biting. I mean, if you guys fish a lot, you've probably heard the nightmare pattern for steelhead, right? That is probably one of the most proclaimed patterns out there because it's effective. It's got contrast, it's got a little bit of different attraction to it, but it's simple. And for that being the case, you always see somebody using that. You talk down the river, it's like, oh, I tried the nightmare pattern. Well, one guy I heard over there caught it, so there's 15 guys now on the bank that are all fishing the same jig, I usually try to be different than that and set myself apart. So I look at conditions on the river to dictate which jigs I'm gonna pick. You could have high water, which requires something with either a heavy contrast or something that's brighter to get the fish's attention. You could have low clear water that requires a tone down in the color. Sometimes that's more mute Sometimes that's a little more dull. So that's super bright. And I think I have a couple of pattern colors, but you can get like the fluorescent, super bright pinks of material, but you can also get the more muted pinks. Sometimes that is the difference that they want, something that's not gonna spook them. Um, and you'll see some cool stuff later on, but there is 
a real component of it when you're on the water and you know there's fish sitting in front of you and you can bounce a jig off their face and they'll move out of the way. But the right color pattern, they're gonna turn and hit. So it's, it's something fun. Obviously, I've, I've done this in some, I'm not an expert, but I've seen guys that know exactly the right pattern every trip. It's behind that rock over there, three casts to the left, boom, every time. And so it's just getting to see how these jigs interact with fish has really changed for me how I go about my presentations, how I prep and get everything to go for the water. So getting started with that, um, I have just a couple up there you can see. There's kind of that difference there. The top jigs that are on the picture there are more of a shrimp imitation that I usually go with. And those are something I've recently tried playing around. Um, they do have some pattern attraction to them, but they also kind of more are looking at a prawn more or less realistic look, whereas the picture below is showcasing you directly attraction. Um, and you can even add the pink worms as a part of that too, just to help. Um, but those are two different profile jigs that work really well in different conditions altogether. And to go to that, you know, getting started in the steelhead jig tying in your cells is something as simple as a vice grip and a couple jig heads and a few materials to get started. But I, I grew up and I still am surprised to this day I still have it. Um, after moving to college, I thought I lost this thing, but a simple clamp on vice is all I've ever really used until maybe five, six years ago um, when I got that nice little 360 one there. But a clamp on vice is very simple to be able to put a jig in. You can put it on any table. I use this a lot in college when we were traveling around fish pyramid lake so we'd be tying jigs literally clamping this to your steering wheel and sitting in the car while it's super windy and tying up the next stuff but with steelhead you can make it whatever you need to for your conditions at home um, sometimes maybe you take a road trip and you don't have a lot of room you can pack something like that very easily these 360 devices are really nice um, where you can find them sometimes on good deals it allows you really to make a lot more simple wraps without having to potentially flip the jig over. Um, it's been really a huge help for my end to speed up the process in the tying, but they're not necessary. That's the biggest thing. That is a luxury if you can afford it, you don't have to have it. Um, and that just makes it fun regardless of what you do. Um, but once you get out of the vise itself, you start looking at the materials. Now, obviously jig heads, are the main part of what composes the jig. And I've done videos, if you ever watch any of my YouTubes, you really don't have to have the lead station. And I would honestly, for most of you, say don't even try it. It's a health risk, potentially. You can get burned. Myself have had issues with it. You can really get away with having to spend all that extra prep time, unless you want to, it's totally fine. But you can get these pre-type or pre-made ones and save you a lot of the hassle. Someone's just getting started, buy a handful of these and invest in just a small amount to see if you like tying jigs. It's a lot easier on you guys than going out and spending $400 just to tie one jig. Because the initial investment in pouring lead is just about that, to get all the right stuff. Yeah, then you're set for life, but is that initial investment something you're gonna enjoy long-term? You gotta make that decision yourself. But for simplicity, that's what I've done. And like I said, these are available at all your local tackle stores. Um, it doesn't have to be just the Yakima Bait one. Aerojig makes some good ones. There's a few other brands out there as well. Most of your tackle stores, depending on your area, are going to carry whatever you guys need. Um, I live closer to Monroe, so we got Three Rivers Tackle out there. I know Cabela's has them. If you guys are in the north end, down south, just about everywhere has something. So you guys can always find the materials truly to get started very easily. Once you get out of the jig heads themselves, you start getting into the actual tying materials. So you can go down a huge rabbit hole with materials because if you go to any fly store, there are racks beyond racks, of thousands of colors of every item out there. I would limit it honestly to getting started with just a couple. 
and you'll see in the next couple of slides here what I mean. But you have the differences in chenilles for the body materials and materials for the tails, like marabou or rabbit. And I found that for the simplicity of steelhead fishing, you can make it as complex or simple as you need it to be. But keeping it on the simple side, you're going to be more successful and less headache. So simple things like just kind of right here, the steelhead yarn. This is one of the easiest jigs you can ever tie. It's two materials with the yarn and chenille, and that's all you need. And you can even pick up some of these cool rabbits as well. Um, but going with that, you then go to your body colors, and the chenille is basically a sparkly yarn. And if you even wanted to, maybe your wife, girlfriend, mom, all has some kind of craft fur or yarn in their area of the house that you can potentially borrow a few pieces from. Um, one of the most common things we always did growing up was just a couple pieces of grandma's yarn, a little bit of the tail end and some for the body, and you were making jigs for nothing. And so that's as easy as it can be. Now you can get, again, fancy at it. You can add your flashes. This is just a standard flash move. It's totally up to you if you want to add that in for something extra to give the fish something they haven't seen too much or get more attraction. You have rubber legs as an extra add-on. Um, but the conditions really, I would say, dictate that. And I tie patterns to set myself up for multiple conditions because you may go to a river and it's too clear. You don't need to have all that extra flash. You can just go all out. Um, and so from there, it just makes it really fun to do and you need then after the material for the body just a standard setup of thread now i've always been kind of proponent when i'm tying salmon or steelhead jigs to go with the heavier thread because growing up i used to snap all the time tying my jigs so i go with the 210 denier thread very straightforward and easy um, and it makes it super you know simple for your end of things to not have to go frustrated about snapping off a bunch of your jig heads and uh, having to retie everything throughout the process. So I keep it with just a couple colors. Use your reds, your pinks, your oranges. You don't need anything too complex because you can pretty much build anything off that. Um, but a lot of times I match the color of thread to either the body color that I'm tying with or the head, but you can accent that as well. The pink on top of something is gonna create a highlight point so again, you can start going down the crazy of making specific patterns if you want, but it's all up to you at the end of the day. And that's what's fun in doing all that. Um, I talked then next here about glue and head cement. Um, so that's something I always use a whip finish on my jigs uh, just to make sure. And then as a 100% piece to make sure I'm knowing not gonna have an issue on the water, I'm gonna put something to glue on it. Now you can get the, the Sally Hansen's Hard as Nails, it's kind of a staple for glue of some sort uh, on your jig tying. Super glue though will do just fine, especially on the simple jigs. One little drop on the thread, it's never gonna come undone. Um, but something I've actually done recently is gone away from glue altogether, and I started using Hypervis tape. If you're not familiar with this, it's a really cool tape made here in Washington State. Um, and the guys that have this have proprietary glue that they use on this that as time goes on, it starts hardening more and more. So I'm tying my jigs, I cut a little sliver off, and I'll show you as we get to this point too of what I do with it. But it makes a really simple jig head that you can cut off the tape, seal it, and not worry about it. So for someone that's in a pinch, it's really easy to do this and not have to let it dry. But reality is just a drop of super glue and you're good to go. So that makes it super easy on the, the material side of things. Again, as complex as you want to make it. And so that's part of the fun. Now we're going to go into here and showcase to you guys specifically tying up a couple of jigs. Um, I would love to have you guys that are out here to come closer so you can watch this. Um, it's going to be kind of fun to have you guys see this in person versus from afar. So if you guys wanted to stand around for a minute, we can go through it and I can show you exactly how to get this done. We're just going to open up a couple of these packs. And if you guys want to 
pass a couple of around. That's just the standard Yakima bait jig head there. Very straightforward, nothing too complicated, but it's a really good owner hook. And that's what I found to be my favorite part of it is I don't lose fish. And that is a big factor. You're not bending fish. You're not having a lot of issues with that. Um, and it makes it really a confidence piece for me on the river or even if I tie something for somebody. I don't want to hand a jig off and be like, hey, I tied the best jig in the world. And my buddy goes, dude, I broke the hook on a branch. So uh, I'm just going to tie up a simple, I call it the reverse nightmare. And basically this guy right here. So we're going to tie it up. It's got the yarn tail. And a Kind of flame red body makes it super cool contrast wise in the water and as simple as these vices are i'll show you with 360 here so we'll tie in the jig make it super straight as you can and these always are, are pressure so you don't want to go too far and potentially damage the hook but it'll be enough to secure it in there and i just start making a good thread wrap foundation on there and you don't really have to cover the tag of the end because ultimately it's just going to be right off the back end of your yarn anyways but this jig it's once you get the thread layers down it's as simple as they come so you can hands free that You'll cut off. Now, I like the glow bug yarn here because it's got a little bit of UV and flash in it. So it makes it, at least in my eyes, I would feel like it, it does something to helping to catch more fish. But I pretty much try about the same length as the hook shank itself. Um, that way I can build up a little bit onto the head and body as you start to tie this in. And I just kind of do a few loose wraps because this stuff is pretty fluffy and they'll try and spin on you if you don't tighten it down correctly. But I'll tie that in, secure the wraps down. Just like that, you pretty much have your tail. Now, some companies will take a small tuff. Have you ever seen the, uh, goodness gracious, brain phase, they, uh, Come back to it but they take put a secondary color on the front of it so you can put two colors together you can really make the tail whatever you want it to be um, it's an arrow jig um, they have a secondary color up front it just it's all preference really at the end of that but um, I go back through and I'll tie in now my machinile and again you you can make these jigs whatever you want to but for contrast again nightmare is one of the most common patterns out there but this reverse nightmare just gives a different look. And so I usually tie in the chenille starting at the head and tie back to the tie point that I want to go from. And the 360 vise, I can just sit here and spin it for myself. If it had been the clamp on, then I'm going around the shank like this. Um, it's not as necessary again, like I said, but it can just make, if you're hammering out a bunch of them, um, a lot easier. Now, you can go two wraps down, but as simple as that jig is, the profile keeps itself really nice. You only really need one wrap. You don't need to go through two. You can if you want to really bulk the pattern up. But what I end up doing is I'll go wrap over that front end, and you can really see it, it's now secure. Um, and then from there, you'll take your scissors, run it right down to the thread, and cut that off. Now this is the whip finish part. So I usually build up a small little thread base there. And again, that's where you can contrast the thread if you want for somewhat of a hot spot. Um, and I usually do, so this is just a half hitch where you grab your fingers with a V and you flip it around. And I do probably three or four half hitches. I do five on that one and then I pull it tight and it'll pretty much break on its own, but it's buried within itself. And that jig will fish just like that. 
but for like I said security purposes I'd rather not have it untie later we'll put a little bit of super glue on there and that jig will be done about 30 seconds of drying and that is a simple little reverse nightmare but then the second one I wanted to go through is a little more involved but allows some different movement in the water because this little guy is going to sit really flat. It's not going to have a whole lot of presentation movement. You can fluff the tail up, you can do a little bit to try and help with that, but you can envision that's just going to keep the profile. It's not going to do much else, it's just going to sit like this in the water. Whereas something that has more of a rabbit tail is going to be able to breathe, it's going to be able to do a few more things for you maybe get more of the fish's attention um just all kind of preference again casein why don't you come up here we're going to pick a couple colors of the rabbit that you want me to tie with um, this one. the pink one yeah. okay well that and how about why not one of the body colors there's like five or six of them the orange one? Yeah. Okay. Good choice. So, with rabbit, there's two different versions of rabbit. There's rabbit where it's the um, straight hide, rabbit honker or zonker strip, and then there's a cross cut. And cross cut is meaning how, how they take it off the hide itself. So when you wrap it down, it's already laying on its side versus this one is made to be more of an actual tail to sit off the end. What I have found, which makes part of the fun of the customizing part, is I actually like to wrap more so with the zonker strips than I do with the cross cut. The cross cut works fine, but the actual cutting of the, the hide sometimes doesn't give enough bulk. So it really is all your preference you wanna do. At this point, when you lay your thread base down, you can choose to add in your rubber legs. You can choose to add in your flash if you really want. I typically, unless I'm planning ahead already and to do that, I'm usually not gonna do. I'm gonna take my rabbit and I tie it in about maybe a quarter inch of the hide and cover that fur. So I really want that sucker to be on there good. The super glue comes in big handy when you're using rabbit because it'll keep it from spinning and you can for sure know that these jigs are going to last a while. Because steelhead do have teeth, they're going to tear apart your jigs if you use them for more than a few fish. So this just helps get you more out of it. Um, but what I'll do, there's a trick in really getting this to wrap right and if you put a little bit of tension on the fur itself on the first wrap you can get it to lay properly just like you would for the cross cut. And my vise is loose, so oops. You can now get it to go. And you'll start to see what happens here in a second. Now, same process as, as wrapping your chenille. I always grab the feathers as I'm starting to go forward and I palmer it back so each wrap is almost on top of itself and as you get it moving forward it really starts to create a body profile now you can stop at any point depending on how you want the tail to look but I've found a cool trick from a buddy of mine that you tie it directly all the way to the head and then tie it off and I always We'll tend to lick it as well because it helps palmer it back you can kind of get a feel for how it's going to look somewhat in the water and from there okay i'll cut this Let's see. okay so that's a steelhead jig in itself if you want to just leave it at that. But part of the fun, when you start wrapping back over the rabbit, it really creates, take a couple of wraps. 
a really poofy tail. And to me, you get a lot more movement out of that and you can kind of play with the direction of how far down you tie it. Usually go about maybe halfway for what you've filled up and then you can go back across and just kind of put that down a little bit more. So then the shrimp color that Kaysen picked here is going to be actually a perfect contrast for this jig because you'll see here in a second same process as the other one I tie it up at the start of the head work its way back and then you'll be able to wrap it forward and again with something like this one it only should need one row going next to each other all the way down but if you feel like maybe the thread base or the rabbit itself didn't give you a good foundation you can always do a second one you can even crisscross back over and get a little bit more bulk to it as well but it really is how you want the the presentation style look to be at the end of it all Same thing, we will now cut that off. And I do advise a hint of caution to be careful not to cut your thread, because that always <laughs> sucks if you make that mistake. Um, and again, whip finish here. Now I'd say pretty good choice there on colors, Kaysen, because that to me, like you can go catch a winter steelhead right now on it. So you can have that one. Yeah. So that that's two basic steelhead jigs. Now I can go forward of mixing patterns together. You can do two colors. Uh, again, it's as complicated as you want to make it. And then the colors are endless. I mean, I just grab a handful out of my tying box, but I want to say that hairline has, it's over 50 colors of just straight plain colors. Then you have all these that are tiger bar and everything under the sun. So it's really to what you guys want to do it. I mean, here's an example of making something supernatural, right? It looks like a little prawn. So you can go as realistic as you want or you can go as complicated and simple, or the other side of it is simple. So those are just the straightforward of getting yourself started on the jigs and how to tie them. Again, I'll pass this around so you guys can see. Those are some of the ties that I've done. Some are commercial bought too, but a lot of what you'll see there is hand tied. And the fun thing that I've learned over the years is, you know, you can sit in your garage and tie up a thousand jigs and then you find you have a pattern you like and you want to fish three of them. So, you know, it, it's, you have them for the conditions that are there. You can really set yourself up for whatever you want to do. And, you know, I usually run as far as sizes go on jigs. Um, eight pounds, which is the ones I tied on there, are pretty much majority conditions um, but you're going to run into where you're going to have a need for a smaller which are those 16 pounds jigs um, rarely do i go the quarter ounce side for steelhead just because a lot of our conditions are going to be more so um, the eight ounce need if you're fishing super high muddy water and you're tight to shore a quarter ounce may benefit you just to get the jig down faster but it really isn't a necessity as far as that goes. It's all just kind of how you set up. And I think really we'll dive into that next. Absolutely. So you guys can have a seat if you want. Um, look a little bit more at how to get yourself set up for float fishing. Um, because you've gone through the process, you've tied your jigs, you're now set up 
with the initial makings to get ready and going forward with um, going to catch some fish. So how do you do that? So if you guys are familiar with float fishing, um, nice part is you can pretty much get away with any rod to get started. You don't have to have the specialty stuff. It does help, um, but fishing for salmon and steelhead does not necessarily require you to go out and buy five hundred dollar rods. This is a velocity eight foot six, um, and I found you want to at least for flow fishing be in that eight foot six, ideally nine foot to ten six, um, just because it helps you really mend the line on the water. Um, I usually go with these smaller size only because some of the small rivers I fish don't have a lot of back casting room, so I can really flip and pitch fish the runs effectively with a little bit shorter rod versus if I'm wide open on the you know, main river sections, I could go with a 13 foot and have as much fun as I want. Um, so that's part of, again, where it fits within any budget to float fish and you can really go out and have a lot of enjoyment doing it. So it requires um, the rod first and then your reel and some may laugh, but Budgetary wise, with salmon and steel, you do not have to spend the most expensive amount of money to get successful and catch fish. Um, growing up for me, I had a $50 Shimano rod and maybe a $30 reel, and I was finding ways to catch fish versus the people that had $500 stuff sitting next to me. Um, this reel is 30 bucks at Walmart. It's their Ozark Trail. I kind of did a tease to it during the early part of the fall salmon to see if this would actually be even worth holding up. And it's so far I hold up to a few fish, haven't burned out any drags. It's just a statement to showcase you guys don't need the expensive gear. Um, a float fishing setup consists of a float in itself, um, as you see in the picture, right? Whether your brand is clear drift, I love them. Um, it could be a West Coast style bone float like you see in the picture. I have one of mine here that I'm prototyping some stuff for. Um, but there's fixed floats and there's slip floats. And for me, I'm almost 99% of the time going with a slip float. And part of that is because I'm usually fishing conditions that I want to have the ability to slide the float around very quickly. And all that's done is with the simple move of the bobber stop. Fixed floats, they do work. You can fish in really shallow water without having to make too many adjustments. I just don't think they're for me, and that's a lot maybe because uh, they're so light. Usually they don't have a lot of weight to them. There are some brands out there that have started doing some added weights to it, but I fish with what I'm confident in, and that's a slight float setup. So you have your bobber stop, then you have some kind of attractant. Uh, I usually use a corky in an opposing color of contrast so I can see when this float sits in the water, if I see that pink corky on top, I know it's maxed out on its depth. Whether or not it's right up against the bobber stop or I'm six feet around it, um, you will be able to tell right away if that's not fishing correctly based on how it sits in the water. I always throw in a nice little soft bead below my float or just a regular bead, but I found these soft ones to really help with protecting your knot, but also protecting your float. If anybody has fished with the clear drift float, they're amazing. I love them, done a lot of good things. They can be brittle on the bottom, right? And you hook a fish and set the hook really hard. I don't know if you've ever seen that. You'll hear that noise of the float whacking against the weight. And it just takes two or three times of doing that and your float's now broken. And it doesn't matter if it's this brand or one of the others. And that sucks. If you're like, man, I made two casts and my float already is broken. So just making a couple adjustments, I found I save a lot more floats, which keeps me fishing longer, which ultimately means more fish hitting the bank. Um, you then will have your small inline weight. Um, I've gone to these inlines from Dave's Tangle Free because they're steel. I don't have to be handling lead anymore. I can literally just pick these up. I can put them in my mouth. I don't have to worry about it. Um, 
it's been a really nice feature because they are so easily able to be used and they come in all sorts of sizes from the half ounce all the way down to the quarter but there's nothing against the lead ones i still pour on my own as well it's just all what you can find um, i like the dave tangle free because he has little cool packs that they come in so that way if you're on the water it's tucked right away it makes it super easy um, i usually run I can back up a little bit on the actual setup. So you have floating line, right? It's a lot like fly fishing. You can win, attest to this because you have a floating line. You want to have a top shot section. I did a video recently on this where I talked about it because you have a top shot that also will float. You will be able to use both in unison to help you mend. And having more ability to have a drag free drift will help get you more bites. And what drag free is, you can envision this float as it's going down the water. If it's sitting like this, perfectly still and not being pulled, it's going to go with the current without moving. If your line is bent this way, that float is either going to get dragged in front of it with the current, it's going to get pulled behind. It's gonna start doing weird things. And to a fish, they're, they're gonna say, if something doesn't look right, that little jig is all of a sudden going Mach 10 by my head, or it's gonna just look out of, out of the ordinary and they're just gonna turn away. Whereas that directly presented without any issues, that natural drift is gonna get bit every time. So it really does make a point to say that because I found using both, not only the braided line, but a floating top shot, will really help you be more successful at how you fish those jigs. Um, under that weight, I usually go about two and a half to three feet of probably 12 pound tests for most conditions. Again, you kind of let that dictate where you're chasing. If I'm going after trophy steelhead on the coast of Washington, I'm probably not going 12 pound test line. I'm probably gonna end up putting 15 to 20 because <laughs> the way I heard it was from Bill Herzog, a fat man that's invisible is invisible. So you can have 20 pound fluorocarbon, it's still invisible fluorocarbon, and it's not gonna hurt you because you're gonna have that sitting there when you hook that giant fish. I'd feel a lot more worried for those people that fish those eight pound test leaders and hook a 20 pound fish, because you're gonna sit there and fight it for a half hour. Uh, so that's that, and then at the end of it, whatever jig you have. So it's pretty straightforward on how you set those up, but always worth going forward to look at that. I think the next one we start of how to read water and get that together. So you put it all together, comes down now to execution, right? When you get to a river, the first thing that I see everybody do, and it's, it's almost hilarious. If you've ever fished any of the hatchery areas, you can go, right at the time the gate opens and watch a sprint. There's like 30 people, full in waders, some can't run, and people are falling down, running to be the first cast on the water. And what do they do? Everybody just chucks it way out there. The worst thing you can do is cast too far. If you hook a fish out there, that's fantastic, but you just brought a fish from way out there across fish that are in front of you. So I've always been told, and this is something I, it's not my, anyways, uh, expertise, no less, but it's more a notion of it that you cast forward in front of you first, start close, you break into a, almost a grid pattern. You start close and you work your way, right? If, if you all could see this in the video land, the chair sets in front of me, right? I would start the first row, make a cast. Then I start the second row, make a cast third and work my way and sequentially I'm adjusting my depth as needed because usually the further you go out is deeper. But closer to you, especially in the hatchery areas, you may have a hundred fish sitting right in front of you. So don't go cast just because you can to the other side of the river. Just like if you have waders, it doesn't mean you go tromping in the water when I can put fish behind your back. So that's just one thing I've learned over the years of watching it is always be aware of your surroundings before you even get to the water. 
Now it's sometimes better to get away from those hatcher areas because you don't have to worry about that rush. But sometimes that's all you're limited to and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But I always usually get to the water first and I observe what's going on. If fish are there, they are going to show themselves. You will see them rolling. You might see something flash in the water. They are going to show themselves at some point. You might be able to be there when you see that or see somebody else that's hooked a fish and you can kind of make an observation where that was. Because then from reading the water, you can start to notice a pattern. Steelhead will go and sit in the same water every year for the most part, as long as the river doesn't change. You're gonna see, hey, I caught a fish behind that rock. Cool, I went back. Hey, look, there's another one sitting over there. They are creatures of habit for the most part, and you can always pick out why those fish are sitting behind there. If they're sitting behind a rock, it's usually because the current breaks and they have a little bit of room to actually rest. Fish are lazy, think about that. They're not gonna to wanna to sit in a highway of water, they're gonna to wanna to sit where it's nice and comfortable. So that's where you're gonna find a lot of that happening. Now, that's you can go into the whole thing of reading the water, but keeping it as simple as possible, you wanna just look for walking speed, you wanna look for stuff that you can see, maybe there's some structure around, a log, maybe there's a couple big boulders. You can start to really pay attention to what the conditions give you. And that'll really help you dictate how you get set up at the start. Same thing with how you pick your colors out when you get to the water. If it's super dirt, dirty and murky, you're going to want to go with maybe something a little bit heavier, a little bit brighter. Again, we talked about it earlier, we can change that if the conditions are clear. So that's kind of how I get started on that. Now, setting your float depth is something that is really important to mention because you can get to the water there. and I have two-ish feet, two and a half feet there. Um, I usually will make a first cast close and shore, like I said, and then see what that does. If my float ends up going backwards, I'm dragging bottom. So I might go, okay, it's really shallow right here. I have to cast out a little bit further or I have to shorten my leader up. So you kind of start to gauge based on what the float tells you on how to change your float depth. If I start um, getting a little bit further out in the river, and my float's fishing perfect, but nothing's happening, maybe I start lengthening it up six inches, maybe a foot, until I start to see it hit the bottom a little bit more, then I bring it right back up, and I know that that fish is more than likely gonna be within six inches to a foot of the bottom almost every time. That really help you dictate how you can target the most effective zone. Because I would hate for you to be on a river, enjoying a wonderful day, everyone else and their brother around you is hooking fish and you're not. And the only thing that's different is you're fishing three feet higher than the fish you're sitting at. So you can easily make a few adjustments by observing or just on your own and help you get into the right zone. Um, kind of covered it already with choosing the jig size and color for the conditions, but that's straightforward enough. The heavier usually you use um, in those murkier water, heavier flows, but there are just extremes in any case. I saw a guy at one point, the water was lower than I've ever seen it. He walked in with a two ounce float and a giant quarter ounce jig. First cast, steal it. Second cast, steal it. No one else was catching anything. And he had the most outrageous thing on his line. He was the only one that caught fish. So there's days where it doesn't matter. You can throw the book out the window, but for the most part, you can just judge it based on the conditions and size. I usually always start with an eighth ounce and go for it. Using bait and scent. So this becomes part of the fun that you kind of get to be a scientist for because you can create whatever combination, colors that you want. Now you can add a factor on top of that'll help you get fit even more. You can add a little bit of scent. Um, you can add bait in itself. On the picture I showcased there, some different shrimp options. You can have coon shrimp cured prawns, that's salad shrimp, a standard store-bought prawn, and then you have a sand shrimp. Now any one of those you can have with you. Any one of those will catch fish. They all are natural. They all have some form of smell to them. Fish will love them. Um, so it's really a preference. You don't have to have all of those with you. Sometimes you might want to if you're crazy like me and carry way too much stuff on the river. 
But um, you can go as simple as just a couple pieces of store-bought rum. And I'll show you a trick. I don't have any with me, um, but the trick that I have is go into your local grocery store. You're gonna look, you're gonna get the weirdest look ever, but you go to the local grocery store, you'll go up to the seafood counter, you'll ask the guy for two white tiger prawns, just two. The cheapest ones they have, and the guy's gonna say, you only want two? Yeah, what are you using them for? And it's not your business, but bait, but sure. And you'll be able to cut those pieces up, and usually for a day's worth of fishing, one prawn gives you about six to seven pieces that you can tip on your jig. Because I cut them about a quarter inch piece. Two shrimp should last you a whole day. It's a dollar fifty to two dollars, depending on what sales they have going on. That's the cheapest bait you're going to get. And prawns will last for really multiple trips. Where if you ever see sand shrimp in the store, you may get lucky and they're fresh. Usually they're dead within a couple days. So. You can find ways to make it easier on yourself by what you pick out as far as bait goes. Um, but a factor that's come out in the recent years and what I have in my hand are these water soluble scents. When you're using jigs in particular, I will pull out a marabou one. Marabou we didn't really touch too much on because it's a little more finicky for tying. When that gets wet, the profile slims way down. It has a lot more movement, no doubt, but the profile slims way down. When you put oil scents on marabou, you just ruin the jig because it will never bounce back. That, that marabou is toast. Um, what has come out with these spray scents is they're water soluble. They were made specifically, this one from Yakima Bay, it was made for the rooster tails. And I actually think that Procure makes it for them. Um, but, these are made to be sprayed on anything. You can spray them on flies, probably get in trouble for somebody saying that, but you can spray them on whatever you want and it's not gonna affect how the material handles it. So, and that's what's cool is instead of having to now think, oh, I forgot my bait, I don't have the ability to go to the store, or whatever may be the reason, you can have a few of these bottles in your bag, it's just as good as having bait if not better in some cases, because it's simple. These don't go bad, really. You can keep them with you, they're really easy. Um, as far as scents go, they're everything under the sun. You can't go wrong with something with shrimp, some kind of fishy scent. This one's the, the Bloody Tuna. Um, either one of those are really good. And an outlier that I'm not gonna agree with is garlic. I love this stuff, but I hate the stuff because it gets on you, it gets on everything, and you smell like garlic for a week. But garlic is one of probably these most potent scents of attraction that you can really fire up fish. Because everybody and their brother heard on the radio that they're biting up nightmare jigs and shrimp. So the next day on the river or whatever Facebook post was out there, they're going with the same exact stuff. It might all take you spraying garlic and fishing something different to get the fish. So I usually carry, because they're so easy and compact, probably three bottles with me, three different scents. And they're not too expensive. I think they're five or six dollar bottles, but that'll last you years. So it really pays for itself, I think, over time. Um, something else that I like to do is, and I think you saw it in one of the original pictures up there, I take plastic worms and I add them to my jigs because it's something that really helps add a little bit to it. Can I borrow your jig back if you got it right there? I'll show you how cool this is. So the reason why I didn't add any flash to this jig is because you can always tip a jig that doesn't have a flash on it. If you have the flash on it, you still can get away with it, but it doesn't fish as well. So. I like the little three inch Mad River worms are really good for this. Um, X Factor Tackle makes a really cool one. It's called a Miracle Worm. It just depends on the profile you're trying to go after. What I do is I'll take the front section of the worm out. Um, there's a little almost egg sack and you can cut that off. Now, this is something you can kind of gauge 
with how the jig looks and how much you want to hang off of it. All right, this is a little bit bulkier, so I'll trim it down just a smidge. But you can make your worms to however big the jig you tie it is. If you want something that's got a lot more profile, you can switch that out. If you want something that's a lot less, you can change that too. And again, when you're using this material, wetting your fingers really helps push it out of the way. You'll thread this on like you're threading on for bass fishing. And as simple as cutting that worm and threading it on, I just added a bunch of bulk to this jig that now has more contrast, it has more color, a little more profile, but I didn't do anything else to the thing. It's a great simple way to do this. Um, and again, the combinations are endless, which makes it half the fun. And just like that, in a lot of places, those worms or any kind of plastic are considered bait. So just a cool little way to add it onto it. I'll give you your jig back. Now you have a little worm. So, and that's as simple as it is, is just finding ways to create your mad scientist that you want to be um, with something else, a little different. I've seen and even experimented with my own uh, soft beads. I don't know if a lot of you are familiar with the soft bead realm. You can get soft beads that come in strings. So you can make a worm out of the strings and tip it on your jig. Um, again, to your own imagination really on that. So it's a lot of fun and that's part of the deal is just you can experiment and do that on the water without having to retie. You just made a whole new presentation and jig just off of that. So it's been a lot of success for me doing it. Um, I'll show this clip because this is really cool. This is last year during the Kobo season. Um, Fishing a jig under float so you can kind of see how it naturally will fish. And you can watch one of the cohos come and grab it. It's pretty cool. It's hard to explain without really seeing it, but when you present a jig as naturally as you can, in theory, you want that jig to fish horizontal, just like this. And in that video, that's what that jig was doing, just coasting down. You saw the first fish push out of the way, then the second pack, the one grabbed it. In the way steelhead are, a lot of the times, that fish has two or three reactions they're gonna do. They're gonna see that thing coming from probably a lot further than you think, and they're either gonna make the decision just to move out of the way, they're gonna back up, or they're gonna turn around and go the other direction. You can start doing that, and you'll see it a lot of times when you fish the tail ends of rivers. Like, uh, the biggest I've ever heard of, the correlation was, you're in a drift boat, and you're rowing plugs down the river. Those fish are getting back into a corner. And once they finally get to the end of that corner, they're either going to aggressively hit it or they're going to turn a beeline down. So the jigs do the same thing. So you can imagine they are seeing that thing forward and coming down at them. They're either going to go after it or they're going to book it out there. And some of those frustrating times are when you see just like that fish there. I've done the camera and I've been like, oh, I shouldn't be watching this because I'm just going to get mad when I see a pod of steelhead and every single one of them with it bouncing off their face just turns and swims the other direction. So it helps to have that natural drift. Not every time obviously is it gonna work, but when you do it the right way, those are the results you're most likely gonna have. Because steelhead are aggressive, that's the beautiful thing about it. Pressured salmon, shut off. Steelhead do the same thing, but steelhead are more aggressive more often than not for a correctly presented option. So really we're at the end of this, what I have for today, um, so I wanted to open it to you guys for any questions you might have. Uh, what, it could be the gear that I showed, tying, really whatever you guys want. So 
but to add uh, like apple bodies on the jigs at all? I do. Um, you'll see in that box that I showed everybody, I've, I've played around with just about everything. So I found on my end of success, like here's one where, you know, this one's got the hackle body, but I cut off the top section of it. And so it looks like shrimp legs and then you can change it. But again, it's, it's preference because sometimes that extra bit of hackle to your point ends up being something that gets more movement in the water. I mean, there's essentially a woolly bugger on a jig, right? And that'll give you a really different profile look than something else that has just the straight chenille. So, it's part of the fun. I mean, I feel like I end up just getting in tying sessions and you realize I have six boxes of jigs and then I go, oh, I guess I won't be needing all of them. So, part of the fun though. <coughs> Anyone else have any questions? Uh, yeah. What you um, got? Can, do you only use those for steelhead or can you use them for any other fish? That's a great question. You can use them for anything you want. One of actually the best things for trout out of like a boat or something is just a small little jig. You can twitch it just like you would for salmon. These work phenomenally well. The only difference you start doing is you play with the different materials. Instead of it, you, the rabbit's really good, but you start doing more of, I'm trying to find one here. You start doing more of the marabou, because it breathes. The marabou is gonna give you whatever movement you put into it with the water. But yes, to your point, they work phenomenally well for everything, really. Good question. Anyone else got any? What normal, uh, what's like a normal meter size? Yeah, uh, good question. I would say probably in that two and a half, three foot is probably normal for most river conditions. But I usually start with that with what I have on the rod there. And usually, it all depends on the rod manufacturer. But if you think from tie point of your eye to about that second guide off the rod, is usually about two and a half, three feet, depending on how big your rod is. And from there, you can adjust. It makes it really easy just to make a couple quick cuts if you have to, but I usually start there and um, yeah, make my decision after that. Good, good question. Yes? Just curious, on, and maybe it hasn't had enough cast go through it yet, but on the reel where it's on the bale, mm -hmm. if you're throwing braid, have you noticed it cut in like they used to into that uh, pivot point there? like where it, Oh, on this? Uh, the guy in the off the bale. Yeah. The little, the little wheel part here in the end? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't. Um, and usually, if they're cheaper reels that have a plastic versus a metal piece, it's probably going to wear more. Braid will ultimately find a groove, right? Um, that's why with some of those foam floats, even, even those plastic ones will do it. Over time, it's going to wear a burn mark and that braid is gonna find a way and make it groove. So I haven't seen it too much happen on the reels, but I've seen it more so honestly happen on the floats. And you can start to tell when you're casting now and instead of your float immediately sinking and sitting right in the water, it might lay flat and you have to twitch it a couple times to really pull it. I usually do an inspection on mine, try and do it at least, and I say that you know, it's in retrospect, but I usually do it every time before I hit the water, but you're gonna do it, and I start playing around with adding little grommets and things as well to kind of help with that. You can't really modify some of those other ones too much, but you always wanna check those every time you go out, um, because God knows that I've done it more than once. You get your rod out, your car ready to go, and you realize I popped the guide out. That's really fun, and you wanna just always do a gear check before the water. But yeah, I haven't noticed it so much on the reels, but it's something you can always look out for though. Have you had it happen with yours? I, I just have a thing before it's on the guides. Then yeah, so the, the, the reels, but... yeah, the ceramic guides will definitely wear out. Right. Um, it's funny, I have a video for this coming up, but um, to do a quick rod tip replacement, you can easily get a rod replacement tip pack at whatever store you want, the Walmart has them like $2 for a pack 
and you always just have those with you and it just takes a lighter or something to get that glue heated up and you can pop it straight off and stick a new one on. But they will happen. Um, I always put that extra bead on there for the top part of the rod. So I don't reel this into my guy and pop it out. So I've done that too. I'm guilty of it. Um, not paying attention and you're like, oh, yeah, I heard that noise. It wasn't good. But yeah, it, it happens with braid just because braid is more abrasive. It's definitely thinner. The mono really is better for casting. That's usually too wide at that top shot. So I usually put anywhere between 8 to 15 feet of that floating top shot. It helps that float literally just slide right up and down and it doesn't do any issues with that. So that's all preference. Some guys tie braid directly to your inline float weight and you don't have to do anything. But I feel like I, because of how fast it'll sink, I'd rather have that move better on the line. And then if it's really spooky fish, they're not going to be able to see that. So I'd rather have that be what they're looking at versus a bright green line or something else for the braid. Any other questions? What's the best knot to, to keep your, your ah, braid from not? That is a great question. I will happily show you one because it's funny. I have tied the same knot since I was 12 years old my dad showed me. Um, I think it's one of the simplest knots you can tie and it really holds itself well when you cock, they call it cocking a jig when you can really get it to sit horizontal. But essentially, it's two loops and that's all you need. So you'll go, and I can share this closer if you want, but pretty much we'll take the line through the jig and then I will go back through. So you're essentially going through the eye twice around itself which then creates a pivot point, and I go a loop behind, a loop behind, and do it three times. So we have three little loops, and then that head again goes back through, and you really want to always wet your line so it doesn't burn itself when you do the knot, and then you tighten that tight. That thing is a perfect. And I mean, I've never had any issues with this knot, never had any problems on me, but I can sit there and do that so fast on the water. And that for me makes a huge difference for getting right back in the game versus trying to set up. But, you know, again, I've done things too where I've started to pre tie my top shot sections with a float rig to it. So I have baggies that have basically a setup ready to go. If I, for some reason, break off everything, I just grab a new one, throw it together, and it's tied on. So it makes it quicker, simple, and really, your time on the water, and more importantly, your time in the water, is gonna help you catch more fish. So the more you can utilize that, simple knots, I mean, there's a million knots out there. Um, I've seen people go as far as cutting this knot off like that, and pushing it to the side, and then retying another one and using the cutoff knot as a point that my line won't be able to circle back over. So you can do a lot of crazy things, but I've found that doubling up on itself through the eye can back in, and then you just have to turn it like that every time. And it's just simple. Usually it doesn't shift too much. Now, if you got a bite and you set the hook, more than like, or touch bottom, it might pull the jig flat and you'll notice right away that it's reeling them in upside down. But I've seen people catch fish just like that too. So I think it helps to have more of that horizontal if you can, but it's not the end all because ultimately, whether that jig is facing this way or flat, the feathers and everything else are gonna look still appeasing to them. Any other question? Thanks for that. Uh, you like paint for steelhead, and we paint because we like paints. What other color jigs do you like when you're fishing like Kings or Coho? So, when Show. you start getting, yeah, when you start getting into salmon, it seems to be more that you get the brighter colors. A lot of the times, you know, like, I would say 
I've caught a lot of kings over the years on the blues and the greens. You know, that generally seems to be something they like. Some of these brighter, flashier colors. If you fish coho specifically, you can think more of adding a lot more flash, a lot more attention grabbing. Um, those fish in the video that you saw, that was a really flashy little white and uh, red jig. Similar to this, but with um, the rabbit instead, but just pretty much all flash. So it just depends on what you're going after. Um, pinks are really a no-brainer as far as pretty much every species, it seems like. But I would say you can go as far as outside the box and start experimenting with um, straight white um, things. I mean, the, the standard of the nightmare seems to work again on everything. I'm just looking through some of the colors here. Blues, um, the chartreuses work really well. But the contrast combination of a lot of it, I mean, you can add different colored legs to them. You can make them look like shrimp. You can make them look like, you know, a squid. I've seen some guys just use, especially during um, some of those days in steelhead fishing, they're just all white. You know, in Alaska, they use those flesh flies that look like dead decaying flesh, right? That's something similar that they're going to look at to grab, and it just all depends on where your conditions are. But I'd say almost the times that it's slower are the times to start experimenting, right? You start drawing whatever may work. Um, and you can get as crazy as you want with this stuff. I mean, I've, I've incorporated some of them that have little beads off the back and glow in the dark. And, and it's just all what you think might work. It probably will if you present it right. Um, but that's part of the fun. I, usually you don't see a lot of um, variances out of those fluorescent colors. But if you combine some of those together, you can have some incredible success because of the contrast. I mean, those little maxi jigs like these here have that pink and the white together. And having that together really helps push a lot of different success and how it moves and fish react to it. So that's another good question. Anyone else have any? All right. Well, thank you guys. That was awesome. Appreciate it.